We've gone from Hello World on an LCD screen to a monochrome VGA display, but what if we could bring the vibrant world of colour and graphics to our VIC-20 build without using the original VIC chip? I'd like to thank everyone who contributes to the comments because someone picked up on something that I accidentally skipped over. I actually wired up this machine a while back, but I'm generating the schematics as I make these videos, so sometimes I do forget to add things in. If we look at this timing diagram, the CPU can read or write the static RAM while CPU clock's high, but we want the machine to perform video data reads from the SRAM while CPU clock's low. I originally had the read-write line from the CPU directly connected to the static RAM, which was fine when we were just driving the LCD, but the 6502 will actually assert this signal while CPU clock's low. This means we need an extra gate to make sure that the write-enable signal on the static RAM can only go low when CPU clock's high. I have this OR gate in the circuit, which does exactly that, but I left this off the last schematic, so thanks for the comments. Here's the power-up screen for a VIC-20 with 32K of RAM, of which only 27.5K is available to BASIC. The most obvious thing we see is at least three different colours. In this image, we have a character colour, which is dark blue. This comes from the colour RAM. But we also have the background colour, which is white, and the border colour, cyan. It turns out that the actual VIC-20 is capable of displaying 16 different colours. It produces an NTSC or PAL composite signal, which goes through an RF modulator onto a TV screen. If you want to know a bit more about NTSC, I've made a video which explains it in more detail, and there's one on PAL on the way. But for this machine, I'm going to generate a VGA signal, which does have a higher dot clock, but even with that, it's still much easier to generate. In this video, we're going to delve into the inner workings of the VIC chip in a bit more detail. These two colours, the background colour and the border colour, are actually stored in the VIC chip. To the 6502, the VIC chip looks like it has 16 read-write memory locations from 9000 hex to 900F hex. But instead of being simple memory slots, these are actually registers that impact the internal functioning of the VIC chip. Now I'm not planning on supporting the light pin, so these two registers are out. Same with the potentiometers. I'll worry about audio later in the series, so that takes out registers 9000A through 9000D and half of 9000E. But I do need the other half of 9000E. What I'm really interested in for now is the data stored in the registers located at 9002, 9003, 9005, 9000E, and 9000F. The way I'm planning to implement these registers in this machine is that all the data will actually be stored in two places. In the main memory static RAM, and in some external 74HC574 octal D-type flip-flops acting as 8-bit registers, which will mirror the contents of the static RAM. A write to these locations will save the value in static RAM and in the appropriate 8-bit register. A read from these locations will read from the static RAM and, the way I've wired it up, it'll also rewrite the value back to the appropriate register, although, strictly speaking, this write back isn't really necessary. This scheme won't work for all registers though, particularly the raster register, but for now it should be okay. What I do want now is a separate load signal for each potential register from 9000 hex to 900F hex, which is 16 independent signals, although for now I'll only be using 5 of them. In the last video, for controlling the data transfer buffer, we decoded the 9000 bar signal, and we also generated a signal to check to see if the vias are being accessed, which I call via select. The good news is that I can reuse these signals to decode the 16 register load signals I'm after. All I need is a pair of 74HC138s. The VIC enable signal is connected to one of the enable inputs. The via select signal goes into another. And now I just need one more signal to differentiate the 9000 to 9007 range and the 9008 to 9000 F address range. I can do this with address line CA3, which is connected to the bottom 74HC138, and the inverted form of this is connected to the upper 74HC138. 
This gives me 16 load signals mapped from 9000 to 9000 and F. Next, I need to add in 574HC574s and I'll add in an extra one for good measure, just in case I need it. While technically the 74HC574 is an Octal D type flip flop, I'm just going to call them registers from now on. The inputs to all of these registers comes from the memory data bus, and the outputs will go to various parts of the circuit. OK, so far so good. In this screen image, we can see three colours. The character colour from the static RAM, the background and border colours, which are both stored in the VIC chip. Interestingly, both the background colour and the border colour are stored at location 9000 and F. Now, it turns out we have 16 background colours, so we need 4 bits for this, but we only have 8 colours available for the border colour and the character colour, so these are 3 bits each. For both the border and character colour, from a video out perspective, I'm going to assume that the top bit of both the border and the character colour are both zero, but they have their own meanings. What I'm going to need for all these colours is another 4 to 1 multiplexer to pick between all the colour sources. 0, 0 is for background, 0, 1 is for border colour, 1, 0 is for the character colour, which is stored in the colour register we built last video. We'll go over multicolour character mode in more detail in a minute, but it uses an extra colour called the auxiliary colour. This is 4 bits, and it's stored in the upper 4 bits of the 9000 and E register. This is the fourth input to the 4 to 1 multiplexer. We're going to need two 74HC153s for this task. Each handles two bits. Input two comes from the color register, which, as we've discussed, is read from the static RAM during memory access. Now, there is actually a problem with this signal, in that it becomes available from the memory read at the start of pixel seven, but I don't really need it until pixel zero of the next character. So I've added in this additional 74HC174, which is a hex D type flip flop. In this configuration, it actually functions similar to a 74HC574, except that it only has six flip flops instead of eight. As a side note, I didn't originally have this chip in place, and in the earlier demos like Qbert and Rat Race, you can see that the color map and the bitmap are out of alignment by one pixel. With this extra 74HC174 in place, which is clocked by the bitmap load signal, the color becomes available at exactly the moment that the bitmap is loaded into the shift register. So now the color and the bitmap are aligned. Now, if you remember in the last video, we had to delay our active signal by one character to hide the first memory access within a scan line. Well, I can incorporate this into the spare bits in the 74HC174, which delays the color signal, and I can use this to generate our shift register pixel data. We have a four bit color value. For the border color and the character color, I'll just make the top bit input to the multiplexer zero. We have a four bit color value, which can come from any one of four locations, background, border, character RAM, and auxiliary color. So we need a way of converting into something we can display on a VGA screen. I've decided that I'm gonna use eight bits to drive the VGA color, three bits for red, three bits for green, and two bits for blue. How do we convert the 4-bit color value into an 8-bit RGB value? Well, I'm going to use another EEPROM for this. I accept it as grossly wasteful to use a 512 kilobyte EEPROM to store 16 bytes of data, but it's still probably the easiest and cheapest solution. I just need to program it with the conversion for 4 bits to 8 bits, which I compute by hand. Now, I put this 74HC574 in between the EEPROM and the VGA port, and that's because the EEPROM output can be undefined for 50 to 100 nanoseconds of the read, and we don't want that to appear as garbage on the screen. By adding this register, we'll have a nice clean pixel all the time, with only one pixel delay. You may have also noticed this 74HC174 going into the color EEPROM. I'll go over this in a moment. To get the various intensity levels, we just need a simple R2R resistor divider ladder per color which converts a 3-bit value into 8 different voltages for VGA. This is a poor man's video DAC, but it works fine for just a couple of bits per colour. Unfortunately, we only have 8 bits out from the EEPROM, so we can't do 3 bits for each of red, green and blue. But it turns out that humans aren't that great at seeing different blue intensities, so we can get away with 2 bits for blue. 
Now, we can't actually generate an intelligible image yet, because we haven't connected our pixel data output from the shift register up to the color multiplexer yet. So far, we've looked at character mode, where there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the bits in the bitmap and pixels on the screen. But the Vic chip has another display mode, called multicolor mode. Here, the system dedicates two bits per screen pixel, so we now have four possible color sources per pixel. But this is done at the expense of horizontal resolution. In this mode, we only have four pixels per bitmap read, so our horizontal resolution becomes only 88 pixels per scan line. Within a bitmap byte, the upper two bits are for the leftmost pixel, bits four and five are for the center left pixel, bits two and three are for the center right pixel, and the lower bits are for the rightmost pixel. How am I going to solve this? Yep, another 4 to 1 multiplexer. You may be starting to notice that most of the TTL logic in this machine is multiplexers, demultiplexers, and registers, with a few gates smattered around the place. Anyway, I've set up a 74HC574, which I call the Multicolor Bitmap Register. Both the shift register and this new register store the bitmap as it comes out of main memory. I want to serialize our multicolor bitmap into four sets of two bit pixel values. Instead of using a shift register to do this, I'm going to set up another 74HC153, which will select two bits from the byte at a time. What I want now are some signals to choose which two bits will be used for the given pixel. If I go back to our timing diagram, I want some select signals which count to 4 within an 8 pixel window. These signals are pretty easy to generate. It's just Q2 and Q3 from our 74HC161, but I've run out of space on the 74HC574 to put them in phase with all the other clock signals, so I'll just add in another 74HC174, which is also clocked by our 16MHz source clock. These signals are called MC MUX011 or Multicolor MUX011, and they connect directly to the 74HC153, which chooses two bits from the Multicolor bitmap register. Alright, we're nearly there. We have valid one bit per pixel data from the shift register, and two bits per pixel colored data from the Multicolor register. How do we decide which one to send to our color multiplexer? Well, this is what the top bit from the color RAM reads for. This bit tells us whether you use standard character mode or multicolor mode. This means character mode or multicolor mode can be selected and changed on a character by character basis within a scan line. To switch between character mode and multicolor mode, I use a 2 to 1 multiplexer, which switches the input based on bit 3 of the color register value. Now, I know that this can all get very confusing on the schematic diagram, but hopefully this block diagram makes it easier to follow. To summarize, we have a multicolor register and a multiplexer, which selects two out of the eight inputs. The selection is driven by the clock circuitry. Next, we have the character mode 8 bit shift register, which produces one bit at a time. We pair this with a ground signal and feed this into a multiplexer, which selects two out of four input signals to produce our color source. Finally, we have a 16 to 4 multiplexer, which selects between four possible colors. In multicolor mode, we can select any of these four colors, but in character mode, we can only select between background color and character color, which is why this input to the multiplex is connected to ground. The output of this multiplexer goes to the EEPROM, but we still have a problem. The signals may have to go through three multiplexes before we have our final color selected. Each one has a propagation delay of about 20 nanoseconds, so this process could cost us 60 nanoseconds in our design. If we add in a 100 nanosecond EEPROM delay, we're well over our 125 nanosecond budget per pixel. Solution Pipeline the multiplexer in the EEPROM lookup, and that's exactly what this additional 74HC174 does. This will shift the image left by one pixel relative to HSync, but that's not really noticeable. There are just two more issues I want to go over in this video. First is the actual border. What I've done in this build is just feed the delayed active signal and the border color bits into some spare address lines on the EEPROM. But it probably would have been just as easy to change this 2 to 1 multiplexer to a 4 to 1 multiplexer. That would have required moving wires, which starts to get more difficult as the build progresses. Finally, 
we have the guard character around each sink. We want these characters to be blank, and I achieve this by disabling the 74HC574 driving the VGA port. I just need to tap off the output from the AND gate for RA14 and RA15. When both these signals are high, I want the colour to be black. Alright, we've made some good progress, but many of the games use a different character format, which is 8x16 pixel mode, and we'll go over that in the next video. We'll also look at the issue of different display resolutions. After that, we'll have a crack at generating sound. If you haven't done so already, remember to like, share and subscribe.